On to now, Gay Search and Jeff Hamilton with more tips for gardeners first time planting. amaze me how quickly plants grow. I'm looking at the garden now, it's hard to believe that we only started planting a few months ago. Well this week we're going to start showing you how to plant the borders. This is our north facing border and in the winter it gets practically no sun at all and even in summer it's in shade for most of the day. So it's obviously important that we choose plants that are going to tolerate those conditions. We'll be showing you which plants to use and also the proper way to plant a shrub. We'll also be looking at the making of a rock garden. We'll be visiting Beth Chateau and Rosemary Veary again to see how their mature north-facing borders look in both spring and summer. And continuing our theme of where to buy plants, I'll be visiting a good old-fashioned general nursery to see if that has any advantages over a garden centre. When it comes to planting our own north-facing border here in the garden at Barnsdale, obviously the most important factor we have to bear in mind is that it's shady. Now we've put the trees in and the next most important thing to go in are the shrubs. Now shrubs are woody plants. Some of them, like this Fertinia, Fertinia Fraser I read Robin, are evergreen. They hang on to their leaves all year. Others, like the Wajila there, will lose theirs in the winter. But the stems remain all year and they actually take quite a long time to reach their final size, ten years or more. Herbaceous plants, like the Heuchera or the Hostas over there, are soft stem plants and they die away in the winter mostly but will come again in the spring. Now shrubs can be very deceptive. You go to a garden centre, you buy something like this Swigela which looks quite small and harmless but in five years or more that's going to be as big as me. Now it's very important with shrubs to get your planting distances right. The Fertinia here is going to grow to at least four feet across and so will the Wigela. So you must plant them at least four feet apart otherwise in a couple of years they're going to be fighting each other and that means you're going to have to start cutting them back. Planting distances aren't quite so important with herbaceous perennials because if they are in the wrong place or they're too close then it's fairly easy to move them and they'll come to no harm. Now as I've said this is our shady border and as a general rule plants that love the shade tend to flower for a shorter season than those that, than those that love the sun and so although we've chosen plants that do flower We've tended to choose them primarily for their foliage to give us as long a season as possible of colour and interest. The heuchera, for example, there has sprays of very pretty tiny white flowers from mid to late summer, but it has these lovely wine red leaves the whole of the growing season. And the Wigela here, this has very, very pretty pale pink foxglove like flowers in early summer. But if you choose this one, which is Wigela florida variegata, as opposed to one of the plain green varieties, then you get this lovely pale yellow and green variegated foliage right through until the autumn. Obviously, a north border can be pretty dark, especially in the winter. So we've chosen plants that are going to brighten it up a bit. Over in the far corner there, we've planted Eliagnus pungens maculata, which is a lovely variegated green and gold shrub. And in the depths of the winter, when the, the flowering cherry is completely bare, that's really going to be a little pool of sunshine in that corner. The same is true of the ivy, ivy gold heart, which will very quickly spread to cover this fence here. It's a smashing shrub for a north wall or fence, and it'll actually tolerate pretty well any soil conditions you care to give it. And in the far corner, for our brightness, we've chosen Mahonia Charity, which has plumes of the most beautiful, bright yellow, fragrant flowers in the depths of winter. The rest of the year it also has this very dramatic jagged foliage and of course don't forget that as the ornamental crab in front of it starts to grow you can lop off those lower branches so you'll get an unimpeded view of the Mahonia all through the year. And when it came to planting the rest of the border colour was obviously an important consideration and here we've got our red area. The, bright, the red of the, the heuchera there will pick up the red tints on the young foliage of the Fertinia but red on its own can be a little bit flat if you're not careful. So to liven it up a bit, we've planted this bright gold Berberus, Berberus thumbergia aurea, just in front of it there. And in front of that, we're going to put 
La Viola Labradorica, which has this wonderful metallic purple leaves, and that will very quickly spread to form a mat in front of the Berberus, and that will set it off a treat. Now, obviously, we've only been able to talk about a few of the plants we've got in this border, but we go into much greater detail about them in the book that goes with the series. Now, once you've got all your plants, it's sensible to place them still in their pots on the border according to your plan. Things on paper, things on the ground can look very different. So if they don't look quite as you'd hoped or you don't think there's something quite right, don't be afraid to move them around and try different combinations. A plan is only a starting point after all. And when you're finally happy that the plants are in the right place, that's the time to get planting. Once you've got your plants set out and moved around to your satisfaction, then it's time to start planting. And the first things to plant are the shrubs. Now, planting a shrub is almost identical, frankly, to planting a tree, which we covered a couple of weeks ago, except, of course, that you don't need a stake. So that does give me the opportunity of showing you just one or two little variations. Now, one thing that doesn't vary is the watering. Always water extremely well before you plant. You should never plant a dry plant. And then dig the hole, making it just a little bit bigger than the size of the container and roughly the right depth. This soil is still quite moist underneath because of course bear in mind we have prepared this really well with plenty of organic matter in it. I can't impress upon you enough how important it is to prepare the whole border first. Now I know I've said it before, but it really is folly to dig a hole in unprepared ground and plant the plant in that hole because it's just going to act like a sump and the roots will rot away. So prepare it well first and just about dig it to about the right level and then put your spade across just the same as with the tree to check the level of the plants and then put the shrub in and that is more or less right. It is worth taking a little bit of trouble over this because it's necessary to get it exactly right. And now you can take the shrub out of the pot and put it in the hole. Now, when I planted the tree, you may remember that I improved the pile of soil that I dug out with some peat. And that's the best thing to do if your soil is on the heavy, sticky side. But quite honestly, the soil here at Barnsdale is really pretty good. And so I don't think there's any necessity to do that. The topsoil is quite good enough. But do make sure that you get the best of the topsoil around the roots of the plants. And the way to do that is just to chip it in from the sides here like that. And then you make sure that soil around there is really good. Just firm it down a little with your boot. No need to go mad with this. You don't want to set it in concrete, but make sure you've got no air holes in there. And then you can improve the soil here with a little bit of fertilizer. That's certainly necessary on most soils. And I'm using rose fertilizer. Just a handful will be enough. And now that soil can go in around the plant. Now one thing you have got to bear in mind is that we're planting this container grown plant right in the middle of summer. So of course it's very prone to drying out. So you must make sure that the soil is nice and moist all around. Really good watering also has the effect of settling the soil in around the roots of the plant really soak it well and then the other thing I'm going to do also to conserve moisture is some mulch around the plant this is a much better use for the peat in this particular instance just a good couple of inches really around the plant will help conserve the moisture by stopping evaporation It'll also prevent weeds coming up around there, which of course also compete for water, bear in mind, as well as looking awful. 
But one thing that I will certainly be doing is coming back from time to time just to check to make sure that the soil is not dry right the way through the summer and that should get away really well. So Rosemary, here we've got a north facing border and a yes. limey soil, so that means a whole different set of plants, doesn't it? Yes, it's a different set of plants but it's the same philosophy over the planting because I've tried to plant in layers so that Really, from Christmas time onwards, we've got the lovely hellebores blooming. Mm. And then, as you see now, here in April, we've got the polyanthus and primroses, which marvellously seed themselves, as the hellebores do as well. And you've also got this marvellous old wall, haven't you, too, oh, no, which gives you so a chance lucky. to... The yes. wall was built in 1770, so I mustn't grumble. And that's a very good wall plant for a north-facing wall, isn't it, the, the ivy gold heart? Yes, it is. I think the one thing you've got to remember is that it does get quite dry under here, and we have to remember to put the hose onto it every so often. But here we've got a, a trailing hardy geranium, which is called Pecumbens, and instead of letting it trail out over the grass, we tie it up against the wall and make it look as though it's a climber. And it actually rather enjoys it. Mm, I think and it's it's size in summer, too. Yes. And of course the other two things that do so well, both on, on a wall and with our limestone, are the roses and the marvellous clematis. You can never have too many clematis in the garden. Absolutely The first not. one along there is the lemon peel one, clematis tanguticus, yes. which matches the gold on the gold heart of the ivy. Yes. And then for good measure, the cockwitzia flowers in the um, third and fourth week in June. And then it's got a clematis again, climbing up it. But also, you've really got to remember to feed your clematis as well. Particularly if they're against a wall, they can get starved. You've got Buddleia growing here as a wall shrub too. Yes, we have. This is Buddleia fallowia in alba. And I put it here because it's slightly more tender than the others. So it gets a bit of protection. Lovely white flowers, mm. loved by the butterflies later in the year. Your roses look very healthy. I mean, you don't normally expect roses to do well on the north wall, but yours look absolutely fine. Well, we discovered that the ramblers and the climbing roses really do perfectly well here, and the pruning is very important. We try and keep these branches going horizontally, and then it means that all of these lateral shoots get a good amount of sap coming up through them, and they all have wonderful blossom on them. And so it means you're seeing them from a lower angle instead of craning your neck in the air and missing them. You have to crane your neck a bit to see this lovely spring flowering clematis, yes. the clematis alpino. Yeah. It's a very pretty one, isn't it? Well, I love the spring flowering ones, but they come out from April and May onwards and they do a really good job, don't they? People often get very discouraged, Beth, by it north-facing borders because they're obviously the darkest border in the garden, little sunlight and often fairly cold and yet you've got a border here which is facing north absolutely superb. Yes, well I mean I think that north borders can be a, a blessing uh, if you're not expecting to have colour all the time but they, they, that coolness allows you to grow many woodland type plants which in the outside in the sun you, you wouldn't possibly be able to grow. But things like the trilliums. Oh, exactly. Now that is a magnificent plant, isn't it? It's almost like a house plant. It, it is, isn't it? Those mo mottled leaves, everything in threes, you see. Three leaves, three sepals, three yes. petals inside. And um, this is the, the, the morning widow, isn't that's it? That's right. It's, this is geranium theum, um, and the dark, almost black. And. Uh, it's not entirely by chance that it's here, but because you see, it does pick up the dark purple of the centre yes. of the trilliums in um, in these tiny little dots of purple. And that's a very reliable plant. Oh, it? easy, uh, easy. easy. It'll grow in the densest shade, with things like Solomon seal and ferns. You see Solomon seal coming up in the back there. Yes, and and of course in the back there the. Uh, one plant that we all know must have acid conditions, of course, the rhododendron. Yes, yes, I don't grow many because on the whole my climate is dry, but here the soil remains moist enough, uh, even in the, a dry summer, and so we have a few, and they do make a, a splendid background. It is a thing to think about, though, isn't it, that they do require a fairly um, humusy 
sort oh, of soil. Oh, they do, they yeah. do, and a bit of overhead shade. I mean, I don't think that they're at their best. You occasionally see them standing out in hot, sunny baked gardens, but I often wonder how long they last. Yes. Uh, and this little blue oh, thing. Oh, well, at that the is a woodland anemone. That's an anemone apennina, and that is just, again, threaded through hostas. Does that seed itself? It, well, no, I don't think it doesn't have much chance to seed here because the planting is fairly yeah. dense. Um, but it does make running rhizomes. Ah, I see. It so seems to be running through, doesn't yes, it, all over the earlier place? Earlier there just... was a very dwarf narcissus, a little uh, narcissus minimus. Uh, and it's running through that, you yes, see. Yes, it's a real woodland effect, certainly. Now, here is a plant which I think that uh, everybody with, with really dry shade ought to grow, the epimedium. Yes. Ones. Well, again, there are quite a number of different epimediums, some with yellow, some pink, some white flowers, and different degrees of marbling. Some are evergreen as well. But you must remember to cut the leaves off early in the spring. These were missed, uh, and so you can only just see the little yellow columbine flowers peeping out there. But the new leaves, when they come in the spring, again, copper at the back, Beautifully veined. They're really a very fine plant, actually, mm. aren't they? And I'm very fond of that little Tiarella, which is a little wild um, American woodland plant. I've seen it growing in the wild. Uh, and there it makes these running little trails. It'll cover um, bare ground very quickly in the shade. By mid-July, there's still a fair bit of flower on the north-facing border and dominated by that big hydrangea in the back. Yes, although it makes um, a, a fair size, it is actually of, of delicate appearance when you look in it closely because it has smaller flowers. It's called Hydrangea cinerea sterilis and it opens green and then gradually matures to those rather pretty uh, cream coloured heads. Now would I be right in thinking that the majority of hydrangeas would do well in a shady spot? Yes, shade or semi-shade I think suits most of them, particularly the lace caps, much better than full sun. But what about the, 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 the mop head, Hydrangea uh, hortensis? They will stand full sun. I mean, you see them uh, on esplanades or on mm. ba embankments, even or by the shade. sea. Yeah. Or they will also grow in shade, yes. Now, in front of that, there's a very eye-catching patch of red. Yes, that is a, a, a very early burying plant, reminding us of autumn that's to come. That's Actea spicata rubra. And it's uh, contrasting very well with a superb blue-leafed hosta. Yes, perhaps my favourite hosta, Halcyon, because it retains its blue. I grow quite a number of blue hostas and uh, seen grown together on the stock beds. This one always stands out as the bluest. Marvellous plant, and you've repeated that over here in a superb collection of uh, foliage plants. Another hosta next to that which is that one well that uh, is more that is commonly known as francis williams although francis williams actually originated in america and this one originated in uh, england but through uh, eric smith who was a great plant breeder and that contrasts very well with the color of that hookah in the front yes that's a uh, very popular plant now with its almost beetroot coloured leaves. That's Heuchera palace purple and it also has a long succession now of small spires of very tiny white flowers lasting literally for months. And even without flower, I like the, the foliage of the Astrantia too, but with flower, it's an added bonus, it isn't it? It is, isn't it? It's a very pretty plant, and there are several different forms of Astrantia. This one is creamy white, but others have pink, and there's an, an almost red-coloured form, and all of them are welcomed by those people who like to make dried flower pictures because they press very well, like they, the centre falls out like the spokes of a wheel when it's pressed. And finally, right at the back, uh, another hydrangea there that uh, looks a little bit more like hydrangea hortensis. Yes, that is a hybrid. Um, but in this garden, uh, both because it's white uh, and because of the, much of the garden's rather too dry for hydrangeas, it, it does better there in the semi-shade and cooler soil. If you've got very free draining soil, then it's easy to grow a whole range of beautiful, colourful alpine plants. But even if you haven't, then it's really not difficult to create a small rock garden, like this demonstration bed here at Barnsdale. Now, the secret of success with alpines is good drainage. 
and that means much better drainage than you might think. Look at this. It probably looks as though it's more stones than soil, but it's exactly the kind of conditions that alpines love. And of course the fact that you're building the bed up above the level of the soil is going to encourage the water to drain off as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate those rock gardens that are small lumps of rock dotted about like currants in a Christmas pudding. The aim really is to make it look as natural as possible, as though it's a rocky outcrop somewhere. And the way to do that is by choosing big pieces of stone and arranging them in such a way that you create small planting pockets for the plants. Now I've dug out a little pocket here behind this rock and I'm going to fill it with a, a mixture which is equal parts soil, coarse grit and peat. Right. Tuck him in under there. And a bit more of this. And once that's in, I'm going to put a thick layer of the same coarse grit on the surface of the soil around the plant. Not only does it look more attractive because it blends in nicely with the rock, but it's actually going to keep the foliage of the plants off the soil in the winter. And wet soil makes alpines rot quicker than almost anything. Now, lots of alpine plants flower in the spring, so it's very easy to have a colourful rock garden then. But by choosing your plants carefully, you can make sure it stays colourful right the way through the summer. I mean, here we are in the middle of August, and this bed is still a picture. Look out for plants like Rhoda hypoxis. It comes in a lovely range of colours. And some of the smaller geraniums, something like the geranium subcorlescens splendens there with its lovely magenta flowers. The yellow hypericum flowers for ages too, right the way through the summer. And don't forget things that are evergreen, like the house leeks, sempervivums. They really are the most interesting group of plants, attractive right the way through the year and very easy to grow. When it comes to buying plants, garden centres do have the great advantage that you can buy everything under one roof. But if it's just plants you're after, then you could be well advised to dig out a good old-fashioned nursery. Because here they actually grow the plants instead of just retailing them. They'll start them off from cuttings or from seeds or perhaps they'll bud or graft onto rootstocks and then they'll grow the plants on so they get an intimate knowledge of how the plants grow and exactly the sort of conditions that they prefer. And they're very happy to pass that knowledge on to you too. Now of course they're like garden centres at their busiest at the weekends so do try and come for your advice during the week. But you'll also find that as well as being first-class stock, you'll generally get them a little bit cheaper too, and that's also because they grow them themselves. But the greatest thing for the plant enthusiast is the much better variety you'll get, and here is a perfect example. This is Sorbus aria lutescens, the white beam, a good tree and the sort of thing that you would find in any garden centre. But it's rare that you'll find its relative Sorbus michelae in a garden centre, it's very much the same sort of tree, but it has a much better colour to the leaves, and the leaves themselves are very much bigger, and it doesn't need me to tell you which one's the better. Of course, you have to remember that a nursery is very much a working area. You'll find it's not nearly as smart as the marketing-orientated garden centre. If, for example, you wanted to come down here in the autumn and buy your plants dug up straight from the field and sold bare-rooted, which is not a bad idea, incidentally, because you'll find that you generally get a bigger plant, which will establish well at that time of the year and at a lower price, but you may well have to trudge through a couple of inches of mud to get to have a look at it. You'll also find that the shop is probably not nearly as salubrious as the one in the garden centre, but with good plants in a good variety and at a lower price, with good advice thrown in, who needs a flashy shop? Once you've planted these shrubs and the herbaceous plants, of course there are going to be quite a few bare spaces, because you must bear in mind that the plan shows the plants in their final size, but these have got quite a lot of growing to do. Well, you can fill those spaces, and the best thing to do it with is annuals. 
course, annuals are plants that are grown from seed, started off in the spring, they flower during the same year, and then when the first frost come along, they'll die. So you've got to start off again the following year fresh, but they'll give you a terrific blaze of colour right the way through the summer. I like to plant mine in drifts rather than in straight rows because this gives a nice informal sort of cottage gardeny effect. But one thing you must be sure you don't do, and that is to plant too close to the shrubs or herbaceous plants. Because if you do that, then of course you're stopping the growth and competing with the plants, and that's the last thing you want to do. If you do find that the annuals are beginning to grow in, then just pull the annuals away, just trim them back a little bit. That won't do them any harm at all. Of course, there is one great limitation for the north-facing border, and that is that you don't get a lot of light. So you are a bit limited with plants, but there are one or two really good ones. Right at the back of the border, I'm using these Mimulus. The new varieties come in a great range of colours now, beautifully marked flowers, and these will grow in quite deep shade, so they're ideal for the back of the border. Also good are the fibrous-rooted begonias too. Again, lots of different flower colours, and you can get these with different leaf colour as well. Beautiful reds and bronzes, which will give you a marvellous show. In the front of the border, I would use lobelia. Again, they'll grow quite well in shade too, and they form great mats of flower. You can buy these in dark blues, light blues and whites, and they're not really good. And I'm very impressed with the new varieties of impatience too. Lots of different colours again, and they'll give you a show right the way through the summer. The border is going to look pretty good once you've planted it, but within a couple of weeks it's going to be a real blaze of colour. It doesn't look at all bad, Gay, does it? No, it's looking very colourful and it shows what you can do, even in a north-facing border, provided you choose plants that are going to be happy in shade. Well, next week we'll be planting up this border, which is the east-facing border, and we'll also be looking at herbaceous plants and climbers. And we'll also be showing another way of buying plants and getting some good planting ideas by visiting other people's gardens. For more information about the plants in this programme, or for our regular Jobs for the Week feature, phone our information line on 0898 555 530.